All right, so I know we're getting to the end of it for the semester. We're starting to uh, to have a lot of stuff that's due. Again, we're this this it's this week, and then next week is the last week as far as new material is concerned. We'll do some stuff to wrap up. Uh, we'll wrap up the semester uh, the week after that, but the week after that really will be the finals week, and that's really and that's the last bit of what uh, you should expect for the semester. So now's the time to start kind of getting with me if you have any questions and if you need some help. Because as things start to progress into next week and the week after, it's gonna you're gonna you're not gonna have much time to do things. And so uh, the, we we really only have three essentially on the books. Technically, there's chapter ten, chapter eleven, chapter twelve. So we, we've got to talk about uh, radicals. We have to talk about uh, there's a synthesis chapter, and then there's the alcohol chapter. So at, in reality, though, the, uh, the discussion about radicals goes pretty quick because at the end of the day, from a synthetic standpoint, there's only one or two practical, um, practical reactions that you have to know. So at this point, keep in mind that there are not, uh, there's not really any new, or there's not gonna be that many new reactions for, chapter, for the radical chapter. Then we discussed synthesis, and as I've mentioned before, synthesis uh, is something that we've been discussing all along, and we'll continue to discuss as we move forward. So what that'll be is essentially a review of some of the considerations that you make when you're trying to solve synthesis problems. And the final bit is alcohols, and alcohol serves as the transition between uh, organic chemistry one and organic chemistry two. And so we don't get to every single reaction and every single mechanism in that chapter, and so we only do a few of the things that are going on in there. Uh, and, and so it won't be a whole chapter either. And so by and large, you really are on the downswing. You really are on the, the, the downslope of this course. And so, you know, the worst, as it were, the hardest stuff is behind you. And so let's, let's talk a little bit about radicals because that's where we're going next. We've seen radicals when it comes to, uh, or at least we've talked about it for just a moment briefly when we think about the anti-Markovnikov addition of bromine to alkenes. When we do that in the, when we add HBr in the presence of peroxide, the expected regio's uh, chemical outcome is that the bromine adds at the least substituted location and we said before that we that was a radical mechanism and that we weren't going to explain it until we get to this point. So I think at the very end of the day, what we're going to see is that uh, that's something that we will uh, will understand with a with the mechanism uh, at the end of the day. But before we get there, we have to talk a little bit about a little bit about radicals, how we represent mechanisms with radicals, radical stability. Uh, introduce this idea of uh, a radical chain reaction and think about how we do uh, halogenation uh, with through a radical chain reaction and then we'll move on to that uh, those reactions and that mechanism with HBr and peroxide and so let me switch my screens And we'll get going. Okay, so um, if we think about at the beginning of the semester when we were talking about bond cleavage, we discussed this idea that we would have homolytic bond cleavage sometimes. And we would think about this in terms of bond dissociation energies. But what we didn't really introduce was how we would represent that from a mechanistic point of view because we hadn't really gotten that far yet. So normally when we do mechanisms, uh, like for instance, if we think about an SN2 mechanism that involves Let's see, let's make this actually favorable for SN2. That involves, let's say, a methoxy attacking a primary carbon and, 
substituting with a, a leaving group. When we do this mechanism, it's we what's happening as far as electron transfer is concerned is that we're always using two electrons at a time. So in this case, we've got a lone pair of electrons on the methoxide attacking the primary carbon and a pair of electrons that was previous that was bonding bromine to that carbon then become a lone pair on the bromide ion we use arrows that have a double arrowhead or a, actually I, I would call it a I'll just call it a standard arrowhead and that has a significance as far as its meaning is concerned. When we use arrows that have a standard arrowhead, we mean that we're showing you a mechanism that's operating based on pairs of electrons. But if you think about it, radicals are not moving around as pairs of electrons. A radical is by definition an unpaired electron. And so we're going to have to use a different type of mechanistic arrow when we think about radical mechanisms. And so what we'll use is a fish hook arrow. And that's an arrow that has only half of a head. So the reason we call it a fish hook is it kind of looks like a fish hook if you've ever seen one. And what this signifies is that one, one uh, electron is moving at a time. And so this is just a little bit different. And there's going to be some different mechanistic moves when it comes to radicals that we'll discuss here in a second. But uh, it's very important to sort of kind of get your, to get that distinction made. When you use a fishhook arrow, you are signifying to the reader that you're moving a single electron at a time. When you use a standard arrow, you are signifying to the reader that you're moving pairs of electrons at a time. All right, so, but once we've made a radical, something like that CH3 radical there, Let's think about what that's like. Well, it, tur it turns out that you have a, a sort of similar situation in, in that it's like uh, the situation is similar to a carbocation where this is an sp2 hybridized carbon. So if I look at it in three-dimensional view, like an sp2 hybridized carbon, there is an unhybridized p orbital, and that's where this lone electron resides. However, it's not exactly like an sp2 hybridized carbon. It's not exactly that situation where in a carbocation we would say that this is perfectly trigonal planar. It turns out that that's not exactly the case. It's not exactly the case that it's perfectly trigonal planar. It's actually slightly It's actually slightly bent away from the electron. It's actually slightly bent. It, the bonds do kind of contract away from the electron. And this is able to rapidly interchange between these slightly bent configurations. <laughs> 
And so at the end of the day, it's not perfectly planar. It's somewhat pyramidal. However, what, now that I've said that it's actually a shallow, shallow pyramid that is rapidly interconverting between the two, uh, in between the two sort of versions, what we'll see is that from a chemical perspective, for all intents and purposes, it does really act as a plane. When we do radical additions, we'll find that it's mostly racemic in its mixture because of the, the uh, if we're forming a new chiral center, because the fact is, is that this shallow pyramid isn't really stuck in one orientation or the other, it's rapidly interconverting. And so you do sort of get an, a, a mixed and even distribution of enantiomers when that's an issue, when that, when that type of reaction comes up. All right, so when it comes to the stability of radicals, you have the exact same, another thing that's similar to carbocations is you have the exact same order of stability when it comes to uh, radicals. So a methyl is less, uh, is, is less stable than a primary, which is less stable than a secondary, which is less stable than a tertiary. And so when it comes to the stability of these different um, radicals, I'm sure then you won't be surprised to learn that you can also have resonance stabilized radicals. And I'm gonna use the exact same allylic example as before. They're also more stable than uh, tertiary even. And so you would show the resonance with slightly different arrows. So it takes more arrows to show the transition between uh, the, the resonance structures joining together two allylic radicals because you have to show one electron moving at a time and you have a total of three electrons involved in the resonance and so that's why we need actually three arrows to completely show the movement of the electrons between these two resonance structures. Not only are there allylic radicals that are stabilized, then I'm sure you won't be surprised to find out that there are also benzylic radicals that are stabilized through resonance. And it takes a few arrows to sort of deal with that. Again, we're going to use one, two, three arrows to show that resonance structure and to show that the radical electron can delocalize into the ring. And then, of course, there's more resonant structures for this particular version. That show that electron continually delocalizing around the ring. And so it's quite similar to the ideas of resonant stability in carbocations. It's just a different mechanistic language to describe the movement of those electrons because re we're really talking about the movement of one electron at a time versus two electrons in the mechanisms that we've been studying up until this point. Does anybody, I'm gonna stop right there just for a quick beat and see if there's anybody that has any questions about this particular issue at this point.
Okay. Now, one thing that's different from carbocations is that if you have a carbocation in this situation, what do you have to worry about? You've got a secondary carbocation here adjacent to a tertiary position. And so in this case, when you have these kind of carbocations that form, you guys have to worry about the possibility that that carbocation could rearrange. It's not true in the case of radicals. This radical will not rearrange. And so there's no analogous rearrangement uh, consideration to be made with radicals as there is with carbocations. So that's one thing you don't have to worry about. Okay. So the next thing I want to do then is actually get into the mechanistic moves. So to review with two electrons, we really only had four mechanistic moves that we were discussing. We had proton transfer, nucleophilic attack, loss of a leaving group, and carbocation rearrangements to worry about. Those were the four mechanistic moves. We're going to have a similar set of mechanistic moves with radicals, but there's actually six instead of four. And uh, uh, they really are, they really do look completely different. And so I think that at the end of the day, they're not too far off in left field. You'll see that there are some similarities in the sense that we're talking about how these electrons move. And if you think, of, uh, think about it from the perspective that we can only move one electron at a time. You'll see how some of these moves then sort of come about and how we need them. One of them we've already discussed. And so this one is homolytic bond cleavage. So homolytic cleavage involves having a single bond and having one electron move to one atom and one electron move to the other atom, resulting in the formation of two radicals. This is typically initiated by heat, and that's what the delta symbol means, or it's initiated by light. And later on, when we talk about the radical reactions that are going to be synthetically useful in this particular chapter, we'll see that the way that we make them happen is with UV light or with heat. And so those are going to be sort of the reagents or one of the conditions of the reactions that we'll use to describe this process or to make it happen. Okay, and so we can also have additions to pi bonds. So I can have- Professor, can I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Uh, when you draw the X to X, can you just do the two electrons on each side so it's more evident that we move one electron at a time? So if you're asking me this question, can you do this? No, like on each side, there's two electrons and two electrons and you show one moving one way and the other one moving the other way. So you're asking me, can you draw it like this? No. Well, um, then, I, then I'm not sure what, so no, I don't that's know okay. what. No, that's okay. Don't, no, never mind. Yeah, yeah. So then the answer to the question is probably no. You can't do it that way. Because the only two acceptable ways to show the products are this way. I guess you could show it this way as well. But, you but at the end of the day, the reaction has to be balanced. There's two X's, so you have to have two X's in the products, and you also have to show that they're radicals. In this case, the radicals are the same, so I just used the stoichiometric coefficient of two to show that. But I can also show homolytic bond cleavage this way. Uh, actually, I'm not making the point I want to make, so let me change this to hydrogen. And so I need to actually show the two different radicals that are formed. I can't just use the stoichiometric coefficient because they're not the same ones. 
And so, no, you, you can't show, you can't, these are really do limit the ways that you can show it. If we can talk offline if you think that there's other suggestions to make when it comes to those radicals. All right, so that's homolytic bond cleavage. And then we were gonna move on to addition to pi bonds. So remember that a pi bond is, re, uh, is reactive and it can act as a nucleophile. And so if it's in the presence of another radical, it can form a bond with that radical forming, uh, putting a radical on the carbon instead of on the X. And so this is absolutely something that is completely different. What's completely different about the mechanistic step that I just showed you for uh, addition to a pi bond is that these arrows, these arrows that I'm pointing to here, literally point into empty space. So remember before when we were thinking about the movements of electrons, we said they never point to empty space. And so that's true with a standard two electron arrow, but that's not true with a radical arrow. Radicals can form single bonds where there weren't any bonds before. And so that necess necess necessitates this uh, pointing into empty space. And so this is something that is completely new to this process. All right, so that's addition to a pi bond. The next, the next, the next ones are called halogen and hydrogen abstraction, respectively. And so if I start with a halogen radical, and I have an, a hydrogen on a carbon chain, then the radical halogen can abstract that hydrogen from the carbon chain, forming the radical on the carbon. A similar situation can happen with halogen abstraction, where if I have a radical on a carbon and a dihalide, the radical on the carbon can abstract the halogen forming another, uh, another radical halogen reaction. Okay. So, so far notice that all of the, all of these reactions have, are forming other radicals as their products. And the same thing is going to be true in this case. This is perhaps the most unusual mechanistic step. This is an elimination. So radicals can form elimination, do eliminations as well and form pi bonds. So let's review real quick. This is homolytic cleavage. This is addition. Uh, this is also homolytic cleavage is the second example. This is addition to a pi bond. This is hydrogen abstraction. This is halogen abstraction. And the last one was 
elimination. There's one last mechanistic move. And this is a coupling. And a coupling is how radicals cease existing in a sense. If you have two radicals coming together, they can form a single bond and now the radicals no, no longer exist. This is the reverse of the first step. This is the reverse of the homolytic cleavage. And so these are, this, is, this is all the mechanistic moves that you have to think about. This is all that, that there is for radicals, but it, it, there, are, there really aren't a whole lot of similarities as far as the four mechanistic moves with two electrons. There, a lot of different things are going on, but it does make chemical sense in my mind. Hopefully it makes some chemical sense in your mind as well. So what I wanna do right there is stop a beat and uh, see if anybody has any questions about that. Okay, and so the, then what we get to are different radical mechanisms, and there's only going to be two that we're going to be responsible for. That's going to be the chlorination chain reaction mechanism, and we're also going to be responsible for the mechanism of the anti-Markovnikov addition to alkenes. But there's three different pieces, or three different types of, uh, of mechanistic moves when it comes to radical mechanisms. And you may have heard these before from general chemistry too. It's initiation, propagation, and termination. And I've wrote this in a way that allows us to sort of see which, which of these uh, me mechanistic steps that we learned just a second ago fit into these categories. The initiations are the examples of initiation are given here. Propagation are, is every one of these steps in between here. And termination is this coupling step. And so what, what, one of the ways that I'll ask a question on an exam is to say, give, an, give, a, give at least one example or give at least two examples of a propagation step or give at least two examples of possible termination steps. And you'll see in a radical chain reaction in the radical chlorination of alke alkanes that, that it does sort of lead to different products that are possible because there's a whole lot of different ways that we can actually get two radicals to come together to terminate the reaction once I've started to add, once I've started to propagate a lot of different radicals in the chemical pot, as it were. And so those are the three things, the propagation, uh, termination, and initiation. And so let's think about this then. This is gonna bring us to the chlorination of methane or the, uh, or the radical halogenation of alkanes. And so the basic reaction involves the following. methane in the presence of Cl2 and UV light forms methyl chloride and HCl. And so let's think about how this works from a mechanistic standpoint, but from a mechanistic standpoint that involves radicals. What we're gonna have is we're gonna have something that starts off with uh, an initiation step. And so that initiation step involves the chlorine. That CL-CL bond is the weakest. And when you interact it with light, it'll form two radicals. <clears throat> 
So this is the initiation step. Once I've initiated the reaction, I can propagate the reaction in several different ways. I can use something like a hydrogen ab abstraction. So let's take methane. Let's have it react with one of those chlorine radicals. And let's have it abstract a hydrogen. So that'll form a CH3 radical and the HCl. R remember one of the other steps is halogen abstraction. And so I could take this CH3, these are just examples. Every combination you can think of is possible. And that CH3 could abstract a halogen And now I've formed my methyl chloride and I've formed another chlorine radical to go out and do more of the chemistry. This is why it's called a chain reaction, a continually forming the species that makes the reaction move forward. So now that I've done a couple of propagation steps, let's think about all the different ways I could do termination. And now that I, when I want to, when I think about termination, I want to think about all of the react, all of the radicals that I've made and how they might react with each other to do termination steps. So what have I made? I've made CL radicals. I've made CH3 radicals and they have different ways that they can react with each other. Uh, I can take two Cl radicals and they can terminate the reaction by forming a single bond between themselves. I've already shown the coupling reaction where uh, the CL and the in the HC in this in a methyl radical form the methyl chloride. That's another way that it can terminate. And here's an interesting product. Maybe you didn't think about. What if two of these things got together, and did a termination? this way. And now I actually form ethane as one of the products. All right. And so at the end of the day, what you have, what you have to be able to understand, uh, re, re, uh, recite for me is an example of the, the radical chain reaction mechanism involving the chlorination of methane. Now, in reality, this reaction isn't particularly uh, synthetically useful because as you add chlorines, this thing continues to be even more reactive to the radical chlorination, and it continues to add chlorines until you end up with carbon tetrachloride. And so, in other words, you can't really control how many chlorines you make, even if you only add one equivalent, you end up getting this really big mix of a bunch of different chlorinated products because each successive chlorination is more reactive to another chlorination as you add chlorines to the groups.
so when one of the last things then I want to sort of mention real quick is that we initiated the reaction with uh, chlorine. And I mentioned to you that the chlorine has a weak bond. And so it is a radical initiator for this particular reaction. It's bond dissociation energy 243 kilojoules per mole. But there's other things. Let's take a look at peroxide. This one's 159 kilojoules per mole. So that's re it's a lot easier for that thing to break. And of course, then you have the resonance stabilized peroxy acids or acyl peroxides. And these things are, of course, these are, this is a uh, 121 kilojoules per mole. It's even easier to form a radical because as I mentioned, it's got some resonance stabilization here. Okay, so let me stop real quick and see if there's any questions about that. All right. Okay, so it turns out at the end of the day, uh, you'll see there's quite a bit of uh, slides that in, are involved in the next, in the next um, sections. But at the end of the day, what it's essentially saying is that we can do all of these reactions with chlorine, we can do it with bromine, we can do it with fluorine, and we can even try to do it with iodine. At the end of the day, the fluorination, radical fluorination of alkanes is so exothermic that it adds fluorines everywhere and it heats up the reaction, it's violent, it's just not useful. So we can't really add fluorines to things. On the other side, iodine is actually endothermic. So it actually takes energy to do an iodation. Chlorination is fairly quick, but it's not particularly selective. And so if you, if you have, we've already discussed the situation with a methyl radical and that's that it continues to add. But if you do Cl2 and H nu in a situation like this, you'll, you, of course, there's a distribution of products. It's 60% for this chlorine product and 40% for that chlorine product. And so the secondary radical is a little bit more stable, so it reacts a little bit faster but it's not stable enough, all right? The bromination itself, bromination is not quite as exothermic as the chlorination, so it's just slightly more selective in that you get the same idea of the distribution of products between the primary and secondary alkyl bromides, but you essentially get 97% here and 3% there. And so this is starting to become
much more synthetically useful to us. In fact, what it really comes down to is the following. If I take something like this and I do chlorination with it versus bromination, even though the, second, the tertiary chlor uh, alkyl halide from resulting from the tertiary radical is so much more is still quite a bit more favorable i still get a 65 35 uh percent distribution of the different products but because the bromination is so much slower i essentially get a hundred percent bromination at that tertiary position and none of this other side product. And so at the end of the day, the moral of the story is this. The only synthetically useful reaction from straight radical halogenation is radical bromination at tertiary positions. That's it. And so if you were to say, let's write the, what reaction do we need to know, Dr. Cotton? I would say that it's this one. This is the reaction I would write on the board. Tertiary substrate in the presence of Br2 and H nu produces tertiary alkyl halide or alkyl bromide specifically. The only other consideration to make would be sort of a regioselective outcome. Here's a tertiary position that's chiral. Or I'm sorry, a stereochemical outcome. So what you end up with, remember, is that that intermediate radical is essentially planar and it, it, it even though it's not planar it rapidly interconverts between both options and so the stereochemistry is that you get a racemic mixture and so if if you get a stereo center that's formed you're going to end up with both the enantiomers present in the products now this this reaction has this reaction of radical bromination at the tertiary position is because bromination is a little bit slower and thus more, more controllable. And that tertiary radical is much more stable leading to predominantly the tertiary product. And when we combine those two things together, we essentially get a hundred percent tertiary alkyl bromide. This is the same is true when we do bromination at the allylic position. So we can also do Br2 H nu and end up with uh, an, an, a, a allylic bromide. And so this reaction also works very well. But what you usually see is that instead of Br2, we're going to use a different reagent. And we usually see this labeled as NBS. And NBS is essentially a bromide radical delivery agent. It looks like this. It's N bromo. Succinamide, it's a five-membered ring joined by a nitrogen with two carbonyl groups. 
and a an, uh, single bond to a bromide. And so it forms two radicals in the process. And this radical, maybe you see, this one is resonance stabilized. So, if, so in other words, what I'm trying to make sure that you understand is that one of the reagents that I'll show you is BR2, the other reagent that I'll show you is NDS. And I wanted you to know what it is and where it comes from and why it delivers bromide, bromine radical. So kind of putting it together, if we did this, what are the possible, what are the possible products here? Turns out that this one has the obvious product, but it also has a less obvious product. And so one of the things that you do have to think about in this uh, reaction is not actually a rearrangement, but it's a situation with allylic and benzylic radicals where their resonance stabilized with different versions. And so remember that in the intermediate, this thing will have a radical that forms in this tertiary position. This tertiary radical is resonance stabilized, and that's what makes it particularly reactive, where I can show the radical appearing on the other carbon. And so ultimately, in the termination steps, this is what makes this have a distribution of products. And so sometimes a, a mixture of isomers is formed when we deal with allylic and benzylic radical reactions. And so that's a consideration that you're going to have to make. It's like a regioselective consideration. The way to make the con consideration is to remember that there's a radical intermediate that's formed. And think about if that radical intermediate has resonance stabilization, if you can show the double bond moving to another location and the radical moving to another carbon. If you can, then that means that the, the whatever is adding to that sub substrate can add at that other carbon's location as well. So let me stop a beat right there and see if there's any questions about that particular bit right there. So that's a little, it's a lot because it, what, we introduced a new type of mechanism. We introduced radical mechanisms. We talked about a whole bunch of new steps involving those mechanisms. Then we showed you the mechanism of a, a sort of a, and it's, and it's not quite step-by-step step in this case. We have been showing mechanisms in a stepwise fashion, but radical mechanisms are sort of happening all at once in a pot together. You've got some initiation happening, you've got some propagation happening, and then eventually you have some termination starting to happen. And at the end of the day, enough termination happens that the reaction stops proceeding in the forward direction. Once enough of the stronger bonds are formed. Then we took that mechanism and we said, okay, let's take a look at chlorination, fluorination, bromination, iodation. We threw fluorination and iodation right up out the window then we took a little harder look at chlorination and bromination and we said, well, at the end of the day, chlorination really isn't that useful either because even because I usually get a mixture of products, even at the tertiary location, I still get a little bit of the other product in, in the mix. And that's not particularly useful 
But when I looked at brumination, all of a sudden, as long as I was looking at brumination at a tertiary position, all of a sudden it was the only product that I got. And so that becomes synthetically useful. In addition to that, we said, all right, what about allylic and benzylic positions? Are these useful? And it turns out certainly they are useful, but we have to make the consideration looking back at the mechanism that a, a intermediate allylic or benzylic radical can sh have resonance structures that lead the radical electron to be in different locations that might lead to different isomeric products. And we have to be aware of that. And so it's not a lot of information as far as clock time, but it is a little bit new information. And so now that I've summarized it, let me take that, that breath that I promised and see if there's any questions about any of that. Okay, so actually there's only one other thing for this chapter, and then um, we're, gonna, we're gonna be done for the day, and that's this anti-Markovnikov edition of, uh, of HBr in the presence of peroxide. And so let's take a look how this works. So the reaction that we're talking about is if we have If we have a double bond, my drawing's just terrible right now. Let me try this one more time. If we have a double bond and we react that with HBr, then we know that we get a Markovnikov addition of bromine. But if we take that same double bond, react it with the same HBr, but then put it in the presence of peroxide, we actually get a different iso isomeric product. We get an anti-Markovnikov addition. We were able to explain the formation of the Markovnikov addition by thinking about its mechanism and how there's an intermediate secondary cation formed and that provides a better, a more stable, uh, situation for the intermediate, thus that intermediate is, is achieved faster, uh, and so the bromide ion attacks in that location more often. So ultimately, radical stability is going to be the reason why the bromide adds in the anti-Markovnikov addition, but it's uh, not quite the same as cations, in the fact that the bromine isn't attacking that radical. And so let's take a look at how this happens. And so if I want to look at this reaction involving the radical brom bromination reaction, we're going to have to start with some sort of initiation. And if you remember from the discussion earlier, the weakest bonds here, the more likely bonds to do the initiation is the peroxide radicals. So the first step of the mechanism is this initiation. The next step involves one of these radicals doing a hydrogen abstraction from HBr to form an alcohol and the bromine radical. So these are the initiation steps. And so now when I've got, now that I've done this initiation, 
let's think about what the possible additions are. If I'm going to add it to this location, then theoretically I can add, I can add the bromine here or I can add the bromine here. The thing is, is that once I've added the bromine through addition to a pi bond, that's my next mechanistic step, addition to a pi bond, I have to think about which one of these radicals would form more favorably. So I'm not, I'm forming an intermediate radical, but what's different than the reaction mechanism that we already know for HBr is that when I form the intermediate, the bromine is already attached. And so this is why I said it's ultimately going to explain the regioselective outcome of the reaction, but it's not going to be able to do it in the sense that uh, it, you're thinking about bromine then coming along to attack that intermediate. If you take a look here, I've got a primary versus a secondary radical that forms. And so the secondary radical is going to form more favorably. And so that's how this next step actually works. I'm going to form or do addition to a pi bond where I form a stable secondary radical. And that's what ultimately explains the regioselective outcome is that in this um, re addition to a pi bond step of the mechanism, the more stable radical will form. And that, and that's, uh, and thus that's what um, uh, prov promotes the anti Markovnikov addition. Now, what we have now to deal with is two more steps. We have to deal with okay, how do I get this thing to be neutral or without a radical, I should say, because it is neutral. And so that involves a hydrogen abstraction from this HBr, some more HBr in the solution. And so here's an additional propagation step where I'm forming the product that I want plus another bromide or bromine radical that can go around and do some more chemistry. But at the end of the day, I can show several different termination steps, one of which could be two bromines getting together to form Br2. And certainly other, pro, uh, other termination steps are possible. So in other words, initiation, then propagation, and several of these steps are propagation. That's propagation, that's propagation, and that's propagation. And then finally, termination. Now, in most semesters, I would also include a discussion about ra radical polymerization. It's very applicable to biochemistry. I'm going to leave it out for this semester due to uh, obvious circumstances. And so what I'm going to do is say, you know, that's it for chapter 10. That's the entirety of the chapter. So really there's only one new reaction and that's the bromination of tertiary or tertiary slash allylic slash benzylic positions. And that's it. Uh, that's really all there is to it. Now we've got these two mechanisms that we have to deal with radical halogenation of alkanes and anti Markovnikov addition to a of HBr to alkenes. But at the end of the day, we've only got one essentially synthetically useful reaction and we've wrapped it up in about an hour and a half. So I'm going to stop the recording right there and open it up for other questions.